I've been thinking about how really at the heart of our work and so much of what I know I've been in dialogue with all of you about over a few years now, at the heart of this is to really remember and recognize and honor the essential worth and value in each human being. And that I've experienced that we hold that to be so precious. And as we've been connecting in different forums this week, that we're deeply concerned, um, saddened. At times there's parts of us that are angered and also energized to ask, what can I do? What's in my power? How can I take responsibility? What is my role here? Um, so I think in different ways, we have been quite literally pausing to ask that question. And um, that's what inspired and motivated uh, the coming together for this meeting. There's been different conversations I've had with you all in your schools and we're asking, so what do we do to um, come together specifically in our school communities? What's our responsibility there? Um, so we have three very special guests who are coming in with collective wisdom and different perspectives. Kenna, John, and Nicole, and I want to warmly and welcome you and thank you. We're honored and grateful to have you here. And in their collective wisdom, they'll introduce themselves in just a moment, but just to give you a sense, we have the IFS and self-leadership perspective, we have restorative practices, trauma-informed specialty, um, love-informed specialty, um, how to be culturally sensitive. So there's hopefully in this collective wisdom, we can together really look at where we're at what we need and how we um, move forward together. My expertise is in trauma-informed care and I base it off of Dr. Bruce Perry's uh, work, which is centered around love and relationships. Right. And I met Nicole and John and Kenna all at an IFS conference. Um, two or three years ago, and Nicole was there as a part of a panel with Black Therapists Rock, which is an extraordinary mm -hmm. group of um, therapists, really profoundly inspiring. And um, John and Kenna approached me to share about restorative practice. So hopefully this is a space of collective wisdom. And um, just as far as then launching into some dialogue and hearing the thoughts you have, Nicole and John and Kenna on this, um, the pulse that I'm hearing in the schools, and, and I'm hearing it again in this circle, is one level is um, what can we do to listen to ourselves, to care for ourselves, to be with the different parts of us that are responding, to be with um, you know, the fact that we're a readiness to enter into, uh, so to speak, uncomfortable conversations, like how can we care for ourselves in this time? And also I think in, there's a fairly immediate question with our schools in Connecticut because school is still in session and we have space to be with our students and next week there could be conversations to acknowledge what's happening, to acknowledge their experience and emotions, to bring them together in community for learning. So I think one of the questions is what are your thoughts and reflections about how we create safe spaces for the adults, for the staff, and how do we create the safe spaces for students to um, to be with this moment. Mm. So, okay. um, Nicole, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you say a safe space, are you talking about for multiple people for the adults? Joanna? Um, I, so in, in the conversations with schools, we've been asking both, because I, I, I guess there's a premise and understanding that if we want to invite teachers to hold, and educators to hold a safe space for students, we start by needing to acknowledge and be present with what's happening for us. So I think yeah. there's first the question of how do we hold the safe space, whether it's one-on-one -on -one, small group or with staffs for the adults. And then a secondary question could be what, what do, would your thoughts be about what we would do with students at this time? So I would definitely say for the adults, maybe have it in um, sections, little, little groups, um, great partners probably because there's usually around four or five depending on how big the school is or if, if that's not enough. You know, uh, I would say a max of 10 because after 10, the space just becomes too large and it's always better to have an intimate space when you're, um, when, when you're trying to promote safety and trying to promote comfort and really have people talk about what's really on their heart coming into it, just be completely judgment-free. So many people are feeling so many different emotions 
and whatever emotions you're feeling, you're allowed to feel, give yourself um, grace, allow yourself to feel every one of those emotions without feeling any type of guilt, without questioning it or anything else. And if those emotions are, um, if those emotions are, um, how can I say this? If those emotions are around guilt, around not having the conversations, just ask yourself, why don't you wanna have the conversation? Why is the conversation uncomfortable? Because what I've um, noticed is, we say that the conversations are uncomfortable, but they're only as uncomfortable as we make them. If we're okay with speaking our truth and saying what's really going on, we should be fine with that. But we see where being quiet has gotten us, you know, it's gotten us here, it's gotten us here. So being quiet, being silent during this time is not how to do it. And just acknowledge everything that you're feeling. If you're feeling that uh, more anger or, or frustration over the fact that there's tons of property damage, show some empathy. Put yourself in the shoes of all of the Black people in this country, all of the Black people around the world. And ask yourself, if this was my brother, if this was my husband, how would I feel right now? How would I want the world to respond? Sometimes we have to take the white, the black um, context out of everything and just ask ourselves, if this was my brother, how would I feel? Um, and we have to ask those questions. And once we start to open up as adults, we can be more open and vulnerable with the children. And with the children, especially depending on the age group, you may not want to go too much in the detail on what's going on because I heard someone say that they teach pre-K and I have four children and at the pre-K level, I definitely was not talking to um, my kids about the murders and all that were happening. I was shielding them from that at that age because I knew at a certain point in their life is inevitable as a black person in America that you have to face these things. So uh, with the earlier grades, you may want to just bring up race in general. Like, hey, um, I, I hear that the, the schools are pretty diverse, but just maybe talk about different cultures and all. What do you do in this culture? The different things that you do in cultures and then talk about how you interact as a whole, how we interact as human and just let the conversation naturally evolve. We don't have to go straight in and talk about what's happening right now with the younger kids. Um, because, you know, like I said, that conversation will evolve. With the older kids, um, it is a must, especially high school, because they're all into it. They're all into the news. A lot of them are going out and they're marching and they're frustrated and they're angry. Um, so just ask them how they're feeling. And you can always start off just, you know, saying this is a safe space. I just really want to get um, everyone's, and what Kenna said, actually, what's the most uh, pressing issue on your heart right now? And maybe give them an example and then just leave them there. But again, you just, you want to keep the spaces intimate with the adults. And then for the class, just have a, a big class discussion. And don't expect that everyone is going to participate because a lot, of, a lot of students just won't. But just hearing that conversation for them is an outlet as well, because then they hear that there's so many of their peers sharing the same feelings as them. So, Nicole, could I do a, just a quick follow-up question? Well, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't know that it's quick, but um, I think I mentioned to you yesterday that I was in conversation with some mental health professionals in schools who were concerned about, you know, especially for teachers who I mean, we're human beings and we can naturally have a relationship, right? We're, we're in connection with each other. So these dialogues at one level, they're natural. And on the other hand, there was some concern. Um, how do we ask questions in a way that's trauma um, safe in terms of children who are experiencing or have experienced trauma? And what questions um, or approach, if anything, comes to mind that really helps to create safety in that sense that when we ask what's on top, any thoughts about what might put some of those, the people who were asking me that at ease? Um, does that make sense or? I, I so, didn't so for example, if, if, so my thinking is in a classroom setting, it can be very helpful just to have a, a simple opening question like Hannah had, like what's on top of your heart? What's on your mind? 
What are some of the main emotions that have been moving through you lately? Just to name them and acknowledge them and have a safe space where we're heard, and, right? Um, and I think my understanding is when you say about the fact that we haven't been talking, I think some people are scared to open the box and to talk about the fact that we have different feelings. You know, and they're scared of what else that might connect to and what else it might bring up. And then people think, oh, what if I don't have the skill to handle that? Oh, I see what you're saying. So there may be cases. Um, so, so you're saying some, the children that may have traumas already going on, if it triggers them, then what? So those are cases where we can't, you know, is almost impossible um, not to have those children in the room. But if that's the case, just recommend, you know, or just suggest in the beginning, if you're feeling any emotions that you need to talk about with someone, you can go see the counselor. Because if, if you're so um, cautious not to have it because of those uh, children that may take it a, a little harder than some of them, the conversations will never uh, be had. So yeah, just record. And this is how it was. I, I did pr plenty of grief meetings at my school because there were students murdered uh, at least one or two every single year. And we will always tell the students, for those that would like to speak up, you can. Uh, we would provide like coloring books and everything. And these were high school students too. And we would provide them with paper and all. So they can, if they don't want to talk, they could write. If, you know, they wanted to make the person a card, they can make a card or we made banners. But we always offer that extra step of going to see the counselor if you need additional supports. Yeah. And I think part of what we're dealing with right now is what do we do when this is all online and it's harder to make that quick link. Mm -hmm. Can I sense that you were responding? Yeah. Can I add something to that? Um, one thing that might help is this. <laughs> Sometimes, and this is something that I learned from some therapists that do a lot of work, you know, trauma work, to just ask, you know, if students are getting triggered, you know, like to just ask them to, um, to just hold on to a pillow or the jacket or a scarf, you know, as an extra layer of just connecting and self-regulating, you know, as a self-regulating you know, uh, uh, methodology. Uh, my sense is that students are like, everybody's really triggered right now. So that's just up there. It's how do we help young people, how do we help ourselves? How do we help you know, our colleagues self-regulate? I don't know if you wanted to add something to that, Nicole. Or... So in terms of self-regulation, because uh, most of the emotions that we feel are in our center. So some of the things that you can do, of course, because we're all at home, if you feel yourself getting too upset, you can hold ice. And what that does is take the uh, attention from the center and brings it to your hands. So um, also, if you're at home, just again, just be honest with yourself and allow yourself to feel all of the feelings. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, well, what I'd like to say a couple of things to the question that you asked, Joanna, if that's okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, one thing to remember when we think about safe spaces is that there's a difference between safe and comfortable spaces. And so if we try to equate the two, then we're not going to get anywhere. No. Um, so having a, you know, creating a space that feels safe, you know, sometimes I know in restorative practices, those of you who are involved in restorative practices probably already do some of that, you know, before we ever, you know, get into circle, which is creating some community agreements. And I think at this moment, being able to just remind folks, whether it's your colleagues, whether it's um, your students, that, you know, we all process both information and emotions differently, and that's okay. Uh, to me, it's, I, you know, it's really important. You know, some people, you know, have their feelings on their sleeve, as they say, other people, as soon as they start feeling something, they go to the part of themselves that, you know, that wants to process the information and get you know, and get into, um, yeah, some theoretical things. 
So all of that is, you know, what can be, you know, what can be there, you know, at the same time. Uh, but so we can create a safe space, but it can still be uncomfortable for those parts of us that either are feeling like we don't know enough, we are not doing enough, or I may put my foot in my mouth, all of that. And that's where we can use some of those skills of being able to just ask, you know, like, it's almost like, I know that for me, you know, I have this, you know, part right now that's there all the time about I'm not doing enough. What I'm doing is not enough. And so I have to constantly be almost like having a conversation with this dear, you know, part of me that is, and saying, it's okay, this is all I can do right now. Chill, come on, honey, you know, step back. So having those inner conversations can, you know, can be helpful, to, you know, for us to be able to have clarity. And the, the other thing that I, you know, like I wanted to, you know, like to say that when student, you know, when we're working with students is that they, whatever they're, how they're experiencing their lives at the moment is valid and important and they want to be heard. So, you know, and I heard, you know, like a number of you saying, yeah, you know, we want to hear them. So creating that space for, um, for them to be able to, you know, like to speak. And yes, first we have to be clear. We need to be able to have that space to, to say, you know, what's in our hearts, what's going on with us, where there's confusion, where there's old stuff that we still need to resolve. And one of the things that, um, that I thought, you know, like that, you know, like that I always bring into the trainings that I do with educators around restorative practices is how we're wired for connection. And it's like such a deep need that we all have as human beings. And right now that connection is just really getting stretched um, because, you know, it's being challenged. You know, like, how do we connect even when, you know, when we're just seeing each other in little boxes? And, and so finding ways of being able to do that and also being able to say, you know, like what you just said, Melissa, about, you know, like how difficult it is, how challenging it is. Um, can also help others who are probably struggling with the same thing. And when we as leaders make ourselves vulnerable in ways that make sense at the moment, you know, show our own vulnerability where we hurt, it, it invites others to do the same thing. And one of the things that, um, that uh, we tried in a circle is to pass around uh, the talking piece so I would say, so for instance, you know, like this is my talking piece, my uh, essential oil that I keep here for when I get stressed out or I get nervous. And so now I'm passing it to the next person. And then the other person grabs it and then shows what their talking piece is and says, this is the talking piece I have right now. And then they pass it to the next person who then grabs it and then, you know, shows their talking piece. And it's, it's a kind of funny way to connect, you know, but it does bring out our creativity and can make it, especially with younger, you know, with young folks, uh, something, I mean, I know it worked with us, we were all adults, so <laughs> it's not just for young people. Uh, however, you know, for young people, it's like it also shows something about where they're at and brings in a piece, yeah. you know, part of themselves into the, into the Zoom room. Maybe a couple thoughts about, um this period of time, one of my, so in addition to IFS um, and restorative practices, I'm also writing and going to be doing a webinar, which this is part of my learning process. Um, I work for the Office of Mental Health for New York State, and so I'm charged with trying to create some kind of an event for providers, kind of what we're doing now, that would be helpful for, <clears throat> for educators, providers, and helping kids and families to process what's been going on. And so I'm trying to integrate the IFS, the restorative practices, and also my mentor's model, which is a phase model, um, which is basically when we have been uh, dealt imposed change, which is that change that we could do without, thank you very much, brought into our lives against what we, you know, what we hope for and what we expect, that people typically go through four phases the first phase of that is crisis. So I'm going to guess that most, at this point, we're 
generally in a crisis phase. Um, and there are certain psychological pieces, social pieces, um, behavioral pieces that show up in that. Um, and then there's some stances that I find very helpful about that. So, so one thing psychologically is we have a sense of loss of control. Um, we have intrusive shame, and that was mentioned earlier about the, the shame piece, which I think can actually happen when any kind of positive affect is interrupted. You know, we're walking down the street and something, you know, we get attacked. That is, you know, an interruption of something positive and we can immediately feel shame. And then we can kind of say, well, what is it about me? What, what's wrong with me that that happened? And then try to find ways to cope with that and to learn from it so it never happens again. It's, it's the proverbial, gosh, if I hadn't worn those you know, that dress, or if I hadn't uh, walked down that street that night, none of this would have happened. So we try to find ways to control things. So giving that sense of control to people um, can be an antidote to that structure, routine, those kind of basic things. And then just bringing it into the conversation of having a meeting would be to structure it as the leader um, to, to kind of set the framework the guidelines, the talking piece. Um, and I think above all, it's respect for each person's story. And sometimes I've, I've jokingly said in a working with a client, you know, speak for yourself. Um, because when we speak for ourselves and we speak for, our, you know, from I statements, generally people can't disagree with that. You know, as we were saying, our feelings are our feelings, our experiences are our experiences. And just in the last couple of days, I've actually changed that phrase to speak from yourself. So as much as possible, if we can speak from ourselves, and this is IFS, Dick Schwartz's model, which is that if we can speak for our parts rather than from them, we have the ability to, to connect with others. We have the ability so that those parts whether they're firefighter parts, angry parts, wounded parts, they don't take us over. And yet we can still acknowledge them. So, you know, even leading with, you know, there's a part of me today that feels um, unprepared to lead this conversation. There's a part of me that feels uncomfortable having this conversation. There's a part of me that is really sad I can't hug you right now. So we can even model that. Um, for our students as well, so that we can we can kind of be in touch ourselves with our core, where all the good stuff comes from, and to connect with our students' cores, where all the good stuff in them comes from. So I think it's just in the way that that's structured, and the um, you know to have people just own their own experiences and to make space for that. I think Scott, you said like. You know, we may get it wrong or we may say something that someone else is triggered by and that's okay, that the person can speak for their own parts that get triggered. And then we can, I used to quote George Bush, George W. Bush a lot <clears throat> to say, you know, George Bush was a uniter, not a divider. I'm actually a divider to be a uniter because I think first we need to be divided in the sense of just owning what's going on for ourselves so that we can then come together with others. I also think that it's very important just to start the meeting off with allowing yourself to breathe, like just breathe for maybe a minute or so and allow yourself to feel whatever feelings that you're feeling at the moment and then remind the kids that those feelings may come up again, you know, or come up stronger when we're talking, when we're discussing those different things. And if those feelings come up, just take a deep breath and allow yourself to breathe. Also another good, a great way that I always suggest, um, and this is from Brene Brown, is to write yourself a contract. Like today I allow myself to feel whatever type of emotions it is that I'm going to feel and not get, um, and I know it's hard, but just listen for understanding because like John was just saying and the gentleman before, people are afraid that they may say the wrong things. But if you're listening just for understanding and not for judgment, 
you'll you'll take what people are saying much easier. I'm wondering if John or Kenna could speak a little more to um, making the agreements when so say you're going to have a conversation with a small group or a class and you want to have some agreements in a simple way that creates the container for people to listen and respect and hear what tips would you offer for how we set those containers um, in the class or with students or with staff? I, I mean, my, my sense is that, you know, like when we, you know, when we create, you know, like some community agreements, sometimes if this is an ongoing group, sometimes it's really helpful to just have it come from the group. If you mm -hmm. can create that kind of time and, ask people you know like internally you know to ask themselves to just check in internally you know like what's going on and what would help them have the best possible conversation and leave from the conversation or from the situation you know from the circle in a way that they feel like their needs got met or and that they were heard and so you know, we invariably somebody will say something about a, about you know confidentiality, and I usually also include something there about you know privacy. You you can always pass. You do not have to speak when you're asked a question, uh, or we can come back to you if needed. And and the other one that always comes up is about judgment. So it so if we switch you know, inviting people to stay in curiosity, then when we're curious, you know, it's very hard to be judgmental at the same time. And that curiosity also, I usually invite people to also spread it to themselves. So it's not just curious about others, it's like, you know, curious about ourselves. So we're not just judging ourselves, you know, like as we're mm -hmm. in the process. And, you know, and the other that, you know, I think it's really important is to make sure you know like if they're you know like a, to ask people if you're one of the quiet ones usually you know grab onto courage so you can also so your voice can be heard if you're one of the ones that jumps into the conversation and hugs it you know roll it back a little bit so that others can be heard and you could listen you know you could put on your you know listening hat so those are some of the ones that to me you know like seem really important in creating a container that you know that will hold and and if it's an ongoing group also sometimes just coming back to them and saying how are we doing where do we need to think about it you know think more about mm -hmm. what our circle agreements are yeah thank you uh the one thing that comes to mind there is the with and it comes from the restorative field and psychology of affect which is to create community, that there's a blueprint for a community. And that is to encourage the free expression and the acknowledgement of positive emotion, affect, the free sharing of negative affect and acknowledgement. Um, and basically just keep doing more of those things so that we wanna make room for all of it. Um, <clears throat> and, and that can be transformative too. Um, the other thing is just in terms of questions, if you're, if you're wondering like, what questions to ask, if you're not familiar with it from the restorative practices field, there are some standard questions that are very open-ended that get to people's experience without, without even having to name the particular experience. Um, questions, there's, there's little, have any, have any one among us seen those cards, the restorative question cards? Yeah. RSD 13 okay. has been training in that this year. Okay. So I think those are just very helpful, generic. Um, what were you thinking at the time? What have you thought since? Um, and even if you ask a social worker, what were you feeling? They're still going to say they, what they were thinking. So don't worry about it. They'll, they'll get to the feelings later. Because hmm. uh, feelings are harder to talk about. Um, what's been the hardest thing for you? What would you, if there's anything that could make things um, more right at this point, what would that be? You know, what part might you play? So those, those kind of generic questions can be conversation starters as well to structure things. i say one thing, you know, going back to the discomfort part at the beginning, because I think to me, this is really important. 
that you know like that we also name what it is that's happening and and you know however it makes sense clearly like you know nicole said you don't you know you talk differently to a kindergartner than you talk to a high school student but being able to just name that the beast that you know is up front in addition to covered <laughs> i mean the epicenter you know i think of the united states still in new york city uh in addition to COVID, is the uncovering of anti-black racism and being able to name that and you know like and figuring out for each one of us myself as a latina i need to figure out how do i walk you know like my talk to be able to you know co to commit to eradicating anti-black racism you know and first in my community because it also exists here and the and also in the out world you know out, outer world and sometimes we get really shy around naming things and i think for some of our kids that drives them nuts when we cannot name things and we try to speak around it so being able to find the words and the clarity which is part of who we are to speak you know, clearly to them about what we see and what, you know, their experience is, I just think it's really important. The clarity and the courage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to just put that out there, you know, as we as educators do our mm -hmm. work. And I just also wanted to thank you all so much for being there and for being so caring mm -hmm. and so committed to your students and to the communities that you work with. My final thought is just be empathetic. I, th I think that's the, the number one thing right now. If we really do um, come with empathy, like if, if that's our top priority, it, it'll make the conversation, it'll make everything else much easier. So empathy. Um, so one piece I just wanna acknowledge because it's been touched but not said explicitly that I think is extremely helpful right now from the IFS model is understanding that all of our parts have a positive intent. So however big or intense or extreme or overwhelming our experience may be, or the parts we're perceiving or experiencing in others, that when we take that time to be empathetic and to welcome them and allow all these different human expressions, when we stop to listen, then once we settle in to hear the heart of where's that part coming from? How is it trying to help that person? What's its job? Where did it get that job? And we don't have to use the word job, but just listening into the heart of what's the positive intent, which doesn't mean it has a positive impact necessarily. It may or it may not. But I think if we can listen into that, then we start coming, settling back into ourselves, back into a place where we can be conscious of what's leading and driving me and what can I bring forward into this situation and what's leading and driving the other person and what would really be the need at the heart of this situation. Um, so to me, the, if I could just recap then, what I see is kind of some of the, the collective wisdom that I'm walking away with, um, that understanding that there's tremendous vulnerability right now, which is activating a lot of different intense responses, reactions, you could call parts of us. If we can hold containers and spaces for each other to listen and be empathetic and courageous, then that listening in itself is a container for healing. Um, and recapping what I heard about how we can hold space even in the immediate with each other, first starting with some ways to regulate, whether holding pillows or breathing, setting structure in the space and some agreements um, that people are welcome to share, all parts are welcome, but they don't have to share. That we, uh, we make use of just the idea of the circle from restorative so that everyone's voice is heard and every voice is brought in and we can even have the idea of bringing in the talking stick. Different ways to name what's on top of our heart, what we're feeling, the different parts of us, our experience, that that's all welcome and valid. Inviting that people can practice and we can model speaking for the parts of us so that hopefully we can unblend and get a little breathing space, but also hopefully then other people can hear us better. And as we model that, perhaps it can be contagious. And that also we model listening without judgment, without agenda, without needing to fix. For those of you, we've done level two listening in your schools. We need the level two listening right now. And that through that process, that in itself starts to bring us towards some form of next steps or solutions or possibilities. But if we don't engage in this authentic dialogue, jumping to action 
is often just jumping from within these different emotions or parts of us, and it may or may not be beneficial. Um, so anyway, that's kind of, uh, I, I was capturing and wanting to just acknowledge and, and um, tie together some of the gifts that were shared. Um, so knowing that some of you may have somewhere else you need to go, I really, really sincerely want to thank Kenna, John, and Nicole for jumping in, jumping in this week, uh, fairly late notice, sharing your different wisdom and expertise. Um, I know I'm speaking with a number of you about how we're going to have um, an ongoing study process this summer, and I hope in different ways that Kenna, John, and Nicole can continue to join us in dialogue uh, to help us really get clear on how we create this space in our schools, this healing space and the space for transformation. So Kenna, would you like to lead us? I know you had thought maybe we could just take one minute for breathing, centering to our hearts as a way to kind of conclude our time together. Would you like to lead that? Sure. So I'm gonna invite you all to I guess you're all sitting somewhere to just either close your eyes or put your eyes, you know, in a soft gaze somewhere that's not the screen and breathe deeply and deeply is deeply for you. You aim for the belly, but let the breath go wherever it is that it lands. And as you breathe, in in your own pace think of a beautiful safe space that you can go to now a place that feels calming to you and where you can just breathe and connect with yourself look around it Notice what's there so you can remember. This could be a place you're making up right now or a place you've seen an image of or a place that you go to often. And while you're here, congratulate yourself for all that you are, who you are. Welcome yourself. There's nothing to do here, nothing to fix. Keep your breath going. And invite calm to come in and sit with you. What does calm look like? Does it have an image, a sound? a smell. Ask it what it wants you to know and remember. And invite courage to sit with you come in and sit with you in your circle with calm. What does it look like? Does it have a sound or an image? A scent? And ask it what it wants you to know. Feel the breeze that is gently caressing your face. And bring in clarity with that breeze. What is the clarity that you're seeking right now? What is it that you need to be clear about in your mind, in your heart, in your being?
and notice your circle of wisdom that is part of who you are. Notice the space you're in. And then slowly in your own time, start walking back to where you are And when you're ready, open your eyes with a gentle gaze or just focus back on yourself and in this meeting. And welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Kenna. So as we finish up, I just want to again thank Kenna and Nicole very, very much for joining us. This is really deeply nourishing. Um, and Nicole, if they want to learn more about your work, they look up Goat Educators. Is that right? They want to see your website? Yes, that's Goat Educators, G-O-A-T, educators.com. It stands for greatest of all time. Okay. And um, can I, I'm not aware if you have a website. I don't know. I haven't yeah. gotten around to it. <laughs> okay. So again, I hope that um, we will find more time to be together in many ways over the summer. And, um, and I know Nicole offers, um, I, I spent quite a bit of time looking at her materials online because her, um, like she had a workshop last night. So I hope that uh, we can join you in your creations, Nicole, um, and all the work that you're doing. So may we stay connected. May we experience our clarity and our courage and keep the conversation alive. Okay. Thank you very much, my friends. Be well. Have a good weekend. Take care.